Okay. Got it. Um, about educational resources, open educational resources, and Rob will introduce her in a minute. But before that, um, a couple of reminders and also thank you for, um, for the reports that you've posted uh, for your first meetings and well done to everyone for participating in it and also uh, for the task leaders uh, for writing the reports. Thank you very much. And the reminders for this week is that you will again meet in your working group um, on this Friday um, at six. And this week, the Spanish students will be the task leaders and send the links to their working groups. So I, I'm sure, Rob, you will remind them again um, to do that. And also, uh, please fill in your learning portfolio every week. Um, you need to do that in order to receive the uh, uh, certificate in the end. Um, and also, of course, you have to take part in the meetings on Fridays. Okay, have I forgotten anything, Rob? Or, uh, right, then now over to you. You can introduce I, I think you are very efficient. You said everything <laughs> we had to say, reminded everybody Perfect. about everything. Very good, okay. <laughs> All right. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, we're delighted to, in to have with us today, Dr. Kelly Arispe. Um, Kelly is a teacher trainer from the Department of World Languages in Boise State University in Idaho. And so basically she's a teacher trainer, mainly Kelly of future foreign Spanish language teachers. Am I right to say that they are exclusively or almost all Sp future Spanish language teachers or what is the case? It's Spanish, French and German and increasingly more Japanese, Chinese and Korean. Actually. Ah, OK. So, yeah, all right. So, of... OK, so you have a good mix. OK. All right. So I'm glad I asked you that to correct that. OK. Um, and we've asked Kelly to come to talk today about her expert area, which is this whole idea of open educational resources. And um, I'm very lucky because Kelly is actually on sabbatical here in Spain in Leon at the moment for the past number of months. So we've been working together on, our, on the Valiant project. And she actually came to my class last year to actually speak to my students about all of this. And it was such a lovely session that I, I wanted to invite her to come back and to talk to all of you as well about this, this whole area, because there's such an amazing amount of resources out there that very often we as teachers, we're not aware of. And, and Kelly's going to talk to us a little bit about what's out there, how they're being used and, and things like that. Okay. So uh, as last week, please, while you're listening, don't be afraid to make some notes and make, write down some questions, which you can put in the chat. OK, and we'll have a few minutes at the end of the of the session to ask Kelly some questions and to discuss things with her. We'll also take some time before the end of the, the session today to talk a little bit about where you guys are going to stay when you come to Leon. OK, we've put together a document with, with information about that, and we'll mention that briefly to you as well. OK, so over to you, Kelly. Thank you very much for coming to us to, to talk to us today. Absolutely. It's such a pleasure to be with you all today. And um, I'm looking forward to your questions. Can everyone see the screen? Should be good to go. Great. So again, my name is Kelly and uh, I'm from the United States. And in case you are not familiar, I decided I'd show you a little bit about where I'm from. Um, so this, I'm originally from California, but now live in the state of Idaho, specifically the Southwest region. Idaho is one of the most rural states in the US. And so one of my jobs is to engage with our community and try to bridge the gap between urban and rural school districts. And so I'm sure a lot of you are facing some of these same uh, questions about inequities across school districts or trying to think through where you might um, where you might teach eventually. And these are these are real issues and real challenges that aren't just specific to the US, of course. But our global issues and OER is one of the ways that um, that I work to help mitigate or to, to reduce uh, that that equity gap, specifically when it comes to access of materials um, for teachers teaching a foreign language. Um, if you've if you're a fan of football, the the throwing kind, uh, we have a really famous stadium because it's this horrific blue color. So if you've ever heard of Boise State, it's probably because it uh, has, has to do with our football stadium, maybe not necessarily with our Department of World Languages, but we're pretty awesome too. Great faculty, and this is a picture of, of, of my university, so if you're ever in town, let me know. I would love to, love to have more uh, colleagues around the world come and visit. 
All right. So like any good teacher, right, I'm going to start off by defining my, my learning outcomes and let you know what I'm hoping we can achieve together today. And the first thing that I want to do is to provide a, a review about, um, so hopefully you've been able to see at minimum that two minute video and then scan through the article and some of the, the resources that I had shared with you ahead of time. If you haven't, or if you didn't get enough of a chance to do that thoroughly, don't fret, don't worry. We'll get the chance to review that today because really I want you to understand on your own terms to be able to tell somebody next to you, this is what OER means, not just the you know open educational resources, but what, what does it really mean and how might it benefit me in my teaching practice? I also really want you to be able to locate these resources. Um, because this is gold for you as teachers. These are excellent resources that have a high quality standard. That means that it's not just something on the internet, um, but it's it's actually been reviewed. It has a, a quality standard that you can trust. And in, in, in most cases, um, they're created by teachers for teachers. So I'm going to show that for you. And I really want you to, to know where to look and how to find these so that uh, maybe tomorrow or in years to come, uh, you can do that with ease. I also am going to showcase uh, the project that I co-direct, which is called the Pathways Project. And I'm really excited to share that with you because we have over 800 activities for language teachers, and 120 of those are in English. And they're ready for you to modify, change, adapt, and use for your classroom. So I'm going to be walking through that with you and specifically talking about interpersonal speaking as an objective, um, as one of the types of modes that we practice in a language classroom. The reason why I want to highlight this is because, as I understand it, um, all of you are in some point in your, in your teaching trajectory. Many of you are maybe just starting out or uh, beginning this process, and so, and then others are, are already actively teaching. It um, doesn't matter where you're at. I think it's really important to talk about the what interpersonal speaking is and why it's so essential in a language classroom. And so in that way, we'll talk about OER, but we're going to also really talk about best practices. And I hope that that's helpful to you, especially as you think about um, your, your classroom. And then finally, I want to talk to you about authentic materials. Authentic materials as um, something that you can integrate and remix or revise with open educational resources. Okay, so those are the learning outcomes. And then you can tell me at the end if I've done an okay job meeting them. Sound good? All right. Cool. So here we are. Introduction to OER. Just went over this to define, identify, and locate. So that's the goal here. Um, you had a chance to watch this two minute video. I would really like for you all to take two minutes, okay? So I'm gonna give you two minutes to think about what you think OER means. And if you're in a classroom with other people, you can just chat um, with one another and, and define that, or you can share uh, via chat if you're online with us today. Does that sound good? So we'll take two minutes and just try to remember what does OER mean? I'm not looking for a paragraph here, just a couple ideas. Um, do the best you can, think through what, what, what is OER, what comes to mind when you think about OER? So everybody can take a minute or two and then either write into the chat. Well, well everybody should do that in fact. Okay, write into the chat is the easiest thing. Okay.
All right. These are three great responses. They each have a different layer, a little different uh, element here. They are free and they're digitally accessible. And uh, the last response here, they are used for both teaching and learning. There are a lot of resources or hubs that aim to provide resources for teacher educate or for teachers rather. Um, they have a free license, that's great. And I really liked, uh, Timo, what you wrote at the beginning that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. I'm a big fan of not reinventing the wheel. And I work with a lot of teachers. I don't know if this is just a US thing or if it's uh, an EU thing, but uh, Teachers Pay Teachers is a very popular website where a lot of teachers spend the, the little money they have on resources for their classroom to find materials that they can use because they don't have time. So I'd really, really like to change that so that teachers didn't have to pay for materials, but could access them quickly and to be able to know how to modify them so that they can customize them for their, for their students. Thanks so much for your responses here, that's great. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and go to the next slide here. This is, um, I'm going to make this uh, presentation accessible for you, of course, uh, because I'm a big fan of OER and I want you to have access to all these materials. Also because I'm gonna be sharing with you a, a bunch of professional development materials that are um, already openly licensed. And so you can use those um, in the future. So I'm not gonna take the time to read over this, but what I really want you to see here is this and, which is underlined. It's really important to me because I think sometimes teachers who teach at the primary and secondary levels think that OER is just a textbook, right? And that it only applies to university, but really OER is much larger than just a textbook. In fact, that's the project that I co-direct is a repository that is full of activities to help you facilitate conversation in your class. And so um, one thing that I hope you can take away from this today is that yes, they're textbooks, but they're also a bunch of other things that can be up openly licensed and that can benefit you in your classroom. And they typically have CC license, um, Creative Commons license is one of the most familiar, um, probably license that you might have heard of. Um, in the US, we have less strict licensing laws than you do in Europe. So I don't want to take the time to go into that because it's quite convoluted. Um, the safest way for you to know whether or not you have permission to share or to remix something is to look for a, a Creative Commons license. And when you have this presentation, and if you're curious, you can come here and, cl and click on this link and it'll give you more information. All right, so let's go on here. This is a helpful way, I think, visually to summarize what OER is. We're all very used to content in print, right? Um, I really still like and, and, and consume a lot of content in print, but we all know that the vast majority of the ways that our students are engaging with, with knowledge and new knowledge is right digitally. However, just because you can find something on the internet does not mean that it's OER. And actually we have two, so if you look at the, this big circle here, we have two types of talking about open resources. One is open access. And this means that you can, op you can access something online and you can redistribute it. But the difference is you can't change it, okay? So when we talk about OER, we're really talking about this very niche blue circle in the middle where people put a license and say, you have the power to personalize and change that. And that's really important to me as an educator because I know my students best and I can take an activity and I can customize it and I can think about my students. And that's really, really important too when we talk about equity and inclusion and I'll, I'll get to that in just a second. So if you're a little, uh, if you'd like more information, again, you'll have access to this presentation and you can see this one page handout. One page handouts are great because they summarize things very efficiently. All right, so here are some uh, ex examples and benefits, right? So we can think, and I would love for you to, uh, to feel like you can engage if, if I'm missing something here. The article talked a lot about um, some advantages uh, for students in terms of OER, but also for teachers, right? There's cost savings is, is one of the obvious ones that comes to mind. 
Um, and then there's also this issue of a uh, really important issue of being able to um, use resources that are up to date. How many of you have taken uh, a language course where uh, the information is so outdated, right? They're in Spain, they're still talking about the peseta and you're okay, we're use the Euro now or right. Or there's a language that's really outdated or you feel like it's only representing. So I can speak for, for the U S if we only sp talked about Spanish from Spain, we'd be missing out on, on 20 other Spanish speaking countries. Right. And so how can we bring more diversity um, into our classroom and OER? is a fabulous way to do that because by working together in a community we can we can um, we can target and and bring uh, bring more diversity to light it also helps increase uh, creativity so I I don't know um, if you if you enjoy or hopefully you'll really enjoy creating activities for your students uh, it's really fun to be able to do that and it's one of the ways the few ways that I call myself a creative is by designing activities and so this is a one of the ways that teachers can do that and engage in that. We also know that when students see themselves in the materials or help co-create OER, that they have better results. And so OER also, um, there are openly uh, uh, open educational resources in terms of assessments too. And so this is really important. All right. So moving right along, um, you read in the article this alliteration, the five R's, right? And so I wanted to go through really quickly. When we talk about OER, there are different ways that you all here can engage with these materials. The first is you can simply try to find them and download them. That's the first R, what we call retain. The second R is what we call reuse, right? So this means that now that I've down downloaded it, I'm going to actually try and use it in my classroom. The third and the fourth R's are where I work with teachers. So I, as a teacher trainer, try to help other teachers really locate and identify in the materials they find online that are open, openly resourced, right? They can, they can manipulate them, how to revise them, where to adapt them, and then also how to increase or how to improve them or augment them by remixing them with other resources. And there is a lot of uh, research on, on these five R's. And one thing that we found by, by engaging in this five, and then sorry, I skipped over the fifth one, which is redistribute, which means once I revised or recreated something, it doesn't just stay with me, but I, I put it back out there so other people can benefit from it. So those are the five R's that were touched on in the article that you, um, you scanned. And what we know is that when teachers engage in this process, it leads to a transformative pedagogical experience. How many of you have heard of constructivist uh, principles of, of teaching or of learning rather. Sorry, have you heard of that? Is that like learner centered, right? Learn, right? Okay. Um, and so this is really a, at the core of what OEP is, OER engaged pedagogy. And it means that again, when we're thinking about these five R's and teachers get in there and they think critically and they reflect on how they can revise and adjust and change things, for their students in mind, it makes them a better teacher. It makes them a better expert of their content, and it leads to a better experience for students. And so that really is at the core of the research that I'm working on currently and a lot of the ways that I work with teachers. There's a bunch of research that, that backs this up that I already mentioned. I'm not going to go over this, but if you were curious, you can have access to some of these. I chose the article that you read today because it's simple and short, um, and I wanted to give you access to a couple different uh, different uh, tools that could be of, helpful, uh, be of help to you. I wanted to show you this. Please don't take a picture of it because I'm currently working on an article that I'm I'm waiting to see if it'll get uh, accepted for publication. But I did want to share this with you. Um, so this is the only uh, tool that's not included in the presentation. But one of the things that I think we talk a lot about competence in language learning, right? So we talk about helping our students move beyond a novice or an A level to a B or a C level, right? And one of the things when we think about OER, and I think this is really important as teachers, is also thinking about how these different processes require a different level of competence. So today, 
you you start out with reusing, right? Finding the retaining and reusing. That's great. That's a good place to start. This takes time to develop. So at the end of this 50 minute, right? Uh, one hour class, you're not going to necessarily have a high level of OEP competence, but little by little by engaging, you can. All right. So, um, and then one of the things that I wanted to, to mention that some of the barriers, because I think it's important not just to highlight some of the benefits, but one of the objectives that you're going to be talking about tomorrow is also, oh, sorry, not tomorrow, on Friday, um, is to think about uh, some of the barriers, right, that teachers will, will have to overcome in order to do this well. And some of that has to do with things that are just related to time, right? Um, and then there are other things like digital literacy or fear of copyright. And so one of the things that we're doing, and hopefully at the end of this uh, presentation and this talk today, you'll want to join our community. But one of the things that we're doing to actively work on helping teachers overcome these barriers is to provide webinars and free content to support these, right? And so these barriers, we, we understand them, we know teachers deal with them, and we're trying to help um, mitigate those for teachers. All right, so let me come back here to this presentation. So now I wanna talk to you a little bit about the Pathways Project. And um, I would love if you have questions about this specifically, so these would be, um, this is a time you haven't necessarily necessarily seen the, this, this part yet. So you might not have a question um, prepared, but if you have a question that comes up, if you could please put it in the chat and I'll do my best at the end to, to engage that way or to, to help answer those. Sound good? Okay. All right. So um, again, I'm going to be talking to you about how to access and become familiar with interpersonal speaking activities. Now, I would love uh, to take a couple minutes for you to think through, so you can chat with your partner if you have somebody next to you, but everybody is invited to respond in the chat. And I liked how a couple of you said, this is this is for you know me and this other person. We, we came to this conclusion, that's fantastic. Um, but if you're alone or if you're online, it's, it's completely fine to just respond uh, individually. So what I want you to think about is what is interpersonal speaking and why does it matter? Okay, so I'm going to give you two minutes. I'm going to put this really cute dog timer on here um, that my students love and give you two minutes to think about that and respond in the chat. Sound good? Okay. All right. Timo, I'm depending on you because you're the only person who has his video on and I really appreciate the gestures. Okay. All right. So here we go.
There you go. There you go. Okay, stop. It's a nice okay. touch with the dogs barking at the end. Yeah, yeah, I know. This is, <laughs> happens every time. All right. So cute dogs aside, let's see here. I see some of the responses. Speaking with the intention of communicating directly um, with some someone else, receiving communication back, authentic speech, conversation. This is important. Absolutely. If I skip over your response, I apologize. I'm trying to ex exchange of ideas, opinions. Great. Um, different circumstances, mutual communicate. Okay. Sharing ideas between two or more people to reach some kind of conclusion or solve a problem. Yeah, can be. Great. So if I go to the next slide here, was just, come on, there we go. Dogs are cute, but all right. So what is interpersonal communication? So this might, hopefully some of you are discussing this. It's the main way we communicate, actually. The main way we communicate is not presentational. This is very odd that I have a prepared presentation and I'm talking to you and you're not interrupting me and saying, huh, or trying to tell me a story or we're not, you know, in some cultures, we, we do a really good job of speaking over one another. This is really normal and accept it, right? Um, and so actually interpersonal communication is, is the main way, the main focus of of all communication. The reason why it's so dynamic is it requires both it requires both receptive and productive uh, communication. So you can imagine the the brain's doing a lot, and it and it's it's especially when we think about our language learners at the novice level. Um, it requires a lot out of them to be able to do this well. It's two way. So you talked about that. It's two way. It's spontaneous and usually mostly unpredictable, right? Especially depending upon on, on with whom you're talking. We have Thanksgiving this week um, in the States, and everybody has a crazy aunt or a crazy uncle. It's crazy. It's very unpredictable, the conversations that happen around the, the table at Thanksgiving. Mostly in, interpersonal speaking is messy and it requires a lot of adjustments and clarifications. And this is really important for our students. Um, I tell my, my, my future teachers, my pre-service teachers, I want to come and hear a loud and messy, organic, authentic conversation in your classroom. I want to see your students getting up and talking to one another and having these false starts and having to correct that's good, right? We shouldn't have perfect communication and interpersonal speaking. It doesn't happen in our native language. It certainly shouldn't happen in our second language. Um, and so this is, this is uh, and, and then you can think of it as speaking, signing, or and listening, right? In conversation, oral conversation, or reading and writing with text messages or via social media, which uh, more and more is becoming a lot like, uh, uh, is becoming an, an analogous, right, to the way that we text message. Why focus on it, right? So I talked about it being the main way we communicate, and many argue that this is, this is more of a natural setting, right? So because it's the main way we communicate, it's important to practice it. Um, these are just some ideas that it's a way for students to communicate, share their thoughts and feelings, and through that, they can form connections with one another. They can learn how to express their needs, right? There are a whole lot of reasons why interpersonal speaking um, is important. So I want to, with that as a segue, talk to you then about why, what, what is the Pathways Project, which is a repository of over 800 activities that target interpersonal speaking. And they are OER, which means, as we saw at the beginning in the beginning section, they're absolutely available for you to change and modify. In fact, we love that. We want you to change them. We want you to take an activity and make it better. Um, and so we also, as I already alluded to, we um, offer professional development, workshops, webinars, research projects, all of it's free. Um, and we also have student projects. So we partner with our students to create a lot of our materials, which is really, really um, important also. Um, and we're a community of friendly uh, language teachers like you all, right? So um, it's a great way for people to be able to connect and feel like the work that they do 
doesn't just benefit their learn their their students, but can benefit students near and far. All right. So what I want to show you too um, is that most of the activities. Um, I'm just going to go through this a little bit faster here. You can have access to it later, but they're performance based. So we recognize that these are activities that are for a classroom, but we really, really try to help students practice real functions, tasks, right? That are that are um, that they, they they should practice so that they can do it in the real world. All right, here we go. And then what I wanted to show you is that every activity follows a similar format. So this is important so you can kind of get a sense for what you should expect. We start with student-friendly can-do statements. And this is important so their students know, okay, I'm going to be engaging in this tough interpersonal speaking activity, but this is what I'm going to get from it. I'm going to be able to do this. I'm going to show you an example in just a second. Every activity has a warm-up. It's really important not to start right here, right? But to give students some access to review. Oftentimes this is reviewing vocabulary, helping prep them for the type of function or task they're gonna do. And then the main task is really where they're talking with one another. It's that spontaneous, right? Um, question answer type of, of task. And then finally, we always try to end these activities with a boost of confidence um, with a, an easy cool down, okay? So this is, this is the workout, if you will, that you can expect from every activity. And then we fi uh, finish by reminding students about the things that we said that they were gonna be able to do and helping them see what they were able to do as a result. It's not gonna be perfect, especially at the novice level. There are gonna be a lot of mistakes and errors, which is normal. Um, and, and so, but we're reminding them that they're, they're focused on functions. Can you do this activity? Can you ask questions? Can you shop online, et cetera, et cetera. We have two hubs where we store all of our activities. And um, I know the vast majority of you here are going to be teaching English. And some of you might be interested or uh, teaching other languages. So I wanted to, to let you know that right now, these are the languages that we, we offer. Um, and we have two different formats, but I'm gonna be showing you OER Commons today where we have um, all of our activities in English. And so you can see here that we have over 100, and, well, we have 120 activities. And every time we create an activity, this grows because we always have a base in English. And then we offer um, that same activity um, in a different language. I'll show you an example here um, so you can navigate this on, uh, on your own. So this is uh, up here are the folders where you can find. And by intermediate, I want to be very clear. Um, we're talking about an A2, <laughs> okay, B1 level, so um, max. In the U.S., we do not have as many opportunities, unfortunately, to learn languages earlier. And so our levels are, are a little bit different. And so take it with a grain of salt. But this is one of the ways that you can revise these activities is to scale them up to make them harder or to make them simpler, depending on, on what you need and what your students need. But you can see here that we've divided them up into uh, novice and intermediate. And then we're also expanding the types of activities that we're, we're offering. So some games, um, some interpretive activities that are really focused on those receptive skills, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so that's what it looks like. And then I wanted to show you a concrete example. And this is um, OER Commons is a fabulous place to come to if you're looking for other types of OER to teach, right, for English. Um, we use OER because, again, it's free and it's, um, it's a really great way to easily make things remixable or revisable. So if you come to our repository and you check out an activity and you say, that's great, but I can do a better job. We would love that. And all you have to do is hit remix this, this source. And basically what happens is it automatically creates a copy for you. And you can get in there and delete things, change things, add things. You have all the power and you are authored when you do that. So when you share it back, your name goes on this resource and there's a clear button that says this was remixed. Okay, so you get the attribution and really it's actually quite easy because it takes the copyright so when I say copyright, it takes the Creative Commons license that we already exist 
and it just copies that for you. So it's a very easy way. It's a fail safe way um, to be able to do this without having to worry about copyright, um, at least de depending on which types of materials you, you mix in. I want to be careful with that, but um, we have a lot of uh, explanations here to, to help guide you. So this is an activity called You're Invited. And it's for the novice mid level. Okay. So this is, I mean, this is like A1, um, A1, A2. And this is a brief description. We use the ACTFL standards here, but you could very easily pull those out and change them with the CFER standards. Um, and then we use the Idaho state because that's the state where we're at, right? We're working with Idaho teachers primarily, but we now have a, um, a much larger audience. One of the things that's really important to know is that all the materials are created for you. They're all here. And all you have to do is click on them and it takes you to a copy of all the things that you have here, right? And so this is um, this is an example of, and you can see different languages here. So you could just take, take this out and create it in English. Um, but here's what I wanted to show you actually. And then the, here's our invitation cards. That's one. Yeah, so you're invited to play soccer. So this is an example, okay, so that this whole task, students are, and I should have explained this beforehand, so students are going to practice accepting and rejecting invitations, but before they do that, they're going to get the chance to create their own, and so they're going to spend um, five to ten minutes creating their um, own invitation and using important things like time, right, date, maybe a couple of things that they need to bring. And then they get up, they mix around and they invite somebody to their event and they practice saying, yes, I want to go to your event or no, I don't want to go to your event, okay? So this is this is the task. Um, this is pretty simple, but it's a way that they are gonna be practicing invitations, right? Free time, hobbies, these, these keywords give you a sense of the activity. What's really nice about all of the Pathways Project activities is that there's a guide for teachers. So you're not left alone, um, especially since um, using the target language is so important. We really try to help teachers by providing a script. If you're starting out, one of the hardest things for me when I started teaching Spanish was knowing if the language I was using was at the right level for my students. So one of the things that we do, we take this very seriously, is we try to think about very comprehensible input and create comprehension checks in these scripts so that your students um, can do these activities. And so it walks you through what the main activity, the task is. And again, all these materials, like this Google slideshow right here, right here is uh, editable for you. So all you'd have to do is go to file and make a copy and it's yours, okay? So that's what the Pathways Project is. I really hope that you'll um, be able to, to get in there and, and check it out. Again, you'll have access to this um, presentation with all of these hyperlinks um, provided for you. Now, I don't have enough time, unfortunately, to go through all the, 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 the other parts, um, but you can look at it. And I want you to think, I'm going to leave you with this uh, awesome chocolate chip recipe because Americans don't have maybe the best desserts in the world, but we have a really good chocolate chip cookie, okay? So here you've got the recipe, but I want to use this as an analogy for you to think through as a teacher. When you look at an activity or if you look at your textbook, you're always looking at it through a frame of how can I make this better, right? Or how can I make this more meaningful for my students? We're constantly revising, just like you would revise an, a recipe, right? You can see in red, these are ways that maybe I get in there and I make this recipe better, okay? Like Mexican vanilla is way better than just boring vanilla. And if you don't know what Mexican vanilla is, I'm so sorry. Hopefully um, one of your supermarkets provides it for you. But there's a lot of ways that we as teachers are thinking about revising or augmenting our materials. Um, and so this is, this is an analogy for you to think through that. Sina, I'm supposed to be done right now to, to open up time for questions, right? Yes, exactly. Okay, all right. So I'll stop that. I'll stop that here. But you have a whole presentation here where you have lots of clickable links and you can check things out and do that in your groups on, on Friday. I'll stop here so you can ask me questions and maybe you'll ask some things that I can point to here too. Okay, thank you very much, Kelly, for, for that very interesting uh, presentation. Um, I invite everyone to put on their, um, to turn on their camera now for the uh, questions, um, that would be nice. I think, um, yeah.
yeah, Rob got kicked out of the, his own Zoom meeting, but um, yeah, I think we will be fine. Um, okay. I guess the students, his students are still online. And um, Kelly, maybe you can stop sharing your screen sure. so uh, we can see each I'm other. Um, yeah, so thanks again. I can see some of my students now, some of the German students sitting together. <laughs> Um, now, um, Kelly, there are already some questions in the chat um, okay. um, about your about your project. And um, Timo, do you want to ask uh, your I'll question? I'll say it. I'll say it aloud. Just so okay, that perfect. Don't have access. So it's it's really a tangential question that's not really super relevant. But does Pathways have Bosque materials because of the historically important Bosque community in Boise? I love that you asked me that question. We have um, there are two places in the U.S. that are. I uh, have one of the largest diaspora of the Basque community and Boise is one of those places. And so um, as a result, uh, we have a lot of students that take Basque language and culture classes. And one of the particular challenges of teaching Basque is that most of the materials for teaching Basque are trans are have Spanish as their their L1. So you can imagine any student who hasn't taken Spanish or isn't a Spanish native speaker has a really hard time benefiting from the textbooks. And so one of the things that we've tried to do is to support our faculty. We have two faculty who are dedicated to teaching Basque language and culture courses um, by creating these materials in Basque. And we have every, every year, we have at least one Basque international student come and stay with us in, in the world, in the world language department. And so um, thanks for asking that question. Probably way too excited about it, but uh, really, really proud to be able to have some Basque materials. They're uh, they're very, very, very difficult to find, actually. So yeah, I want to add it to that that I'm I'm, I'm studying Basque in another virtual mm -hmm. class right now, but uh, no connection there. But um, yeah, that it's it's really I found it's very common in smaller languages that that frequently there's maybe like either they're monolingual resources or then that they come from some sort of more common, let's say, prestige language that that they're based upon. So, that's yeah, a and then issue. and then also too, sometimes the the very the the scant resources they have are very grammar grammar oriented, right? And so they're really lacking in being able to help prepare students for those more functional task based types of um, activities that are so important. So, yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, so great poten potential, I guess, for, for some less commonly um, spoken languages and open educational resources, I assume, Kelly, um, if, yeah. I, if I got that uh, right. Absolutely. Um, now, if anyone has a question, you can just raise your hand or, or type it in the chat. I cannot see um, any more questions in the chat right now, um, but I know that every one of you has prepared at least one question for Kelly, so you might as well ask her um, now. Um, otherwise, Kelly, um, I was looking through those different different resources that you have linked to the document. Mm -hmm. And one thing I can imagine to be tricky is um, where to start. Because, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you usually have like a goal for your lesson or, you know, yeah. a certain learner group. Mm -hmm. And there is so much. So maybe you have some advice on, you know, um, how to basically prepare you know, to work with those um, different platforms that, that you linked. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that I wished I would have learned earlier when I was in, in your place was the benefit of joining. Uh, when I find a resource, they often have newsletters or they have, they'll periodically send out information to keep you updated on new materials or access points. And I'm not just saying this because we have a newsletter, but I would, we do try to highlight. Um, so I'm going to put in the chat uh, the, the link um, that will take you to signing up. We send out a newsletter once a month and we will highlight activities, free resources, webinars, not just our own, but others. And one of the most important things that you can do is when you find a good resource is to bookmark it and if possible to join some type of um, list serve so that you, you get that communication. It is uh, very, very daunting to find the right resources. But once you do, uh, you it's, it's, it's a treasure trove uh, for you. It will be so beneficial. So that's, um, that's my advice. 
we also have um I do I didn't get to to share it with you but let me put the link we have um uh, a bunch of materials of course in in the pathways OER commons group that are professional development materials and this is one of my favorites um, and it highlights authentic materials specifically and digital humanities sites. And so it's a booklet that is uh, created um, for you to think about, okay, what are some types of materials that would be helpful for me to engage students in functional tasks? And so this booklet um, at the on the very last page, so if um, on the very last page it, it has an index, and you can actually um, use that index to, to find some of these materials as well. So um, yeah, there's 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 so much information out there. And, and I would say that tr just like we teach in technology, right? So um, don't try all the apps and don't do all the things in your first year. Take two and do them well, right? Uh, you don't need to, to use all of the language learning apps with your students. They'll be very overwhelmed. The same thing with OER. Find a couple and try them out. And uh, and remember that, that pyramid, right? It's a competence. It's a skill that you build over time. So, yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot. I think that's that's very helpful to, um, you know, start with one or two ideas and then, you know, build up on that every every yeah. year that you're teaching. Um, now, there is a question in the chat and um, I don't let me see. I don't know whether you can see it, Kelly. Otherwise, I just I read it out. And this was, yeah, um, so this was a, a question that I, that was asked at the very beginning. And I'm very glad that this person uh, posted it again. So yeah, um, it's very frustrating, right? That so many of the tools that we love have uh, a, you know, a free version that's this big when we really want the, the full access, right? So like Padlet, if you're familiar with Padlet is one of my favorites. And I keep having to recycle my Padlet boards so that I don't have to pay. Um, I'm with you. It's it's a frustration. And so uh, one of the things I'm not as familiar with OER software, but Wikipedia has a really actually helpful page. And at the very bottom, they link out to some of the places where you can find OER software and apps. And this would so if this is a, an interest of yours, I would encourage you to go to the bottom of this page um, and to check that out. Wikipedia and Wikimedia are also some phenomenal places to check out and to start with. And if some of you probably contribute to Wikipedia and Wikimedia, which are two excellent resources, um, especially when we talk about OER. So, but yeah, this page will will help orient you to some of that some of that work. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Um, mm -hmm. Right, I I think Rob, we need to talk about some other things. Other things I don't yeah. know whether we have time for more questions. I assume not. Okay, um, we better not. So let's say thank you to Kelly. Everybody here, turn on your cameras for a second at least, and say thank to say thank you to Kelly for a lovely talk, a very informative talk. Okay, I know I know that in. In, in a, well, they've had their cameras turned off because we're fighting with the Wi-Fi here. Even I was kicked out of the Wi-Fi here for a little for five minutes during the talk. Okay, so that's why we deliberately did that. It's not big out of passivity or anything like that. I, no, I know, <laughs> no worries. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so yeah, so thank you very much, Kelly. That was really useful. I know that we, we had time yesterday in class to look at those those all of those resources that you shared with us, and there's so many things there. So many, it's so interesting that to know that this is out there. And even just to compare it to, to 20 years ago, right, when I was starting off teaching, right, and how, you know, we would have killed for things like this, you know, and now and now it's there. So, I mean, well done. Thanks for showing, telling us all about it. Okay. And by the way, I noticed, Kelly, one more thing, that a lot of them have communities. I mean, how active are these communities of teachers? Do teachers, I mean, communicate to each other as well as part from just sharing resources? Yeah, so there's there's two main conferences and they've got some spe special interest groups that you can join and one of them is OE Global. Uh they have a they have a conference that's great but they also have an active community of teachers and then the other is Open Education. And so there's a lot of work being done there where you can yes be part of a, of, of active communities for sure. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, which is what, yeah. what we're trying to do here, right? To promote yeah. these communities of practice. And that's so, so important for teachers, right? Yeah. Language teachers. Thank you very much, Kelly. Yeah. Okay. okay, we do well, have one more question, I think, from Leonie. Do we have time for that? Oh, uh, sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Perfect. Definitely. Um, just a quick one, because I was hoping um, that you get a little bit into it in your talk. Um, I was wondering if you have any ideas on how to propose or establish OER in schools or teaching teams, maybe from your own experience even. Yes, I love this question. I'm actually on a, a collaborative and it's really exciting because it's community based. So we build from the bottom up rather than from top down. Right. And so it's a it's an initiative that's happening in the US where we are trying to work with districts um, across states uh, to build OER specifically for K through 12. And it's very exciting to see this work because most of the work in OER happens at the university and then maybe comes to K through 12. And really this initiative is starting in the reverse, right? So it's starting actually with the community of teachers, figuring out what they need. And I'll I'll post the, the website in the chat so that you can see. And then um and then I I, I don't know if um I'm not as knowledgeable about a, about a, a type of a resource like this in the EU, but OE Global would be the other way to do that. So while you're talking about the, some of the details, I'll, I'll look and, and post some of these links for you in the chat. Sound good? Okay, great That's question. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you, Leonie, for asking that question. And thanks, Kelly, for answering it. Um, okay. All right. So, so very quickly then, for those of you that are not from Spain and that are uh, coming to Spain to, to for our week in January, okay, this this is the document that we've put together that I put it into the chat, <clears throat> um, which will hopefully bring you through, <clears throat> you know, help you to get organized and and to to get to Leon first of all, and then to find accommodation in Leon, okay. Um, well, I put this together being very aware of your um, the amount of funding that is being made available to you all. Okay, that, I think that's really important that your funding is limited. So I deliberately, um, over the past couple of weeks, contacted uh, what I would call cheap accommodation and tried to put together a list for you. Okay, in that document on page one, uh, you'll find out about how to get from, um, well, basically what I recommend is that people try to fly or get to Madrid, to start from Madrid, okay? When you're getting, going to Leon, that's the easiest way, I think. So you get to Madrid as early as you can. And then there are two options, traveling by train, which takes about two hours, and or traveling by bus, which can take between four hours or four and a half hours. So it can be a little bit longer, okay? The, the thing about the bus is that it's, first of all, it's cheaper. It's about half the price normally, a bus ride compared to a train ride. And secondly, there are buses that leave from Madrid airport. So you don't have to worry about getting into do the, any train station or bus station. Okay. So all of that information is there on page one of that document. But what I recommend is that you get early flights into Madrid, because once you get to Madrid, you then have to con con continue on with your journey to Leon. Right. And then uh, on page two and three, uh, you've got a collection of three or four um, places of accommodation that we would recommend more or less. Okay. Um, I contacted them during the week and the, the prices that are quoted to me uh, were the prices they said, well, you know, I said, we're I mean, students coming to University of Leon and I quoted the dates when you'd be here. And this is the, what they said. Having said that, when you contact them, always be very sure to make sure that they confirm those prices with you. Okay. You cannot say, well, you know, we said one thing on the document, and a second thing on the um, uh, on the reality. Okay, before you come to Leon, when you make your booking, double check that that is the price that you are being quoted. Uh, the first uh, the first place I'm quote um, showing you there, El Albergue de Pelegrinos, is um, a, a hostel basically for pil pilgrims who are doing the Camino de Santiago. It is certainly what we would call no frills. Okay, it is very much basic but it will probably be the cheapest one. And if you're traveling with maybe a couple of friends from your class, you can even share a room and that makes things very cheap there. Okay. And breakfast is included in that one. Uh, in the other three, uh, breakfast may not be included. Okay. So, but there are, shall we say, nicer places in, in a very nice locations in the old town. You can see from the pictures that they're right next to um, old monuments and things like that. So there are other options as well. Of course, an awful lot of you are probably used to working with Airbnb as well. And you can also go to the Airbnb website or booking. 
and look for accommodation that way as well. All right. However, what I would recommend is that you all start doing this now. Okay. And get it out of the way. Get your, 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 um, your accommodation booked. Okay. And plan, you know, for the, for the days you're going to be here. And so that is one less thing you have to worry about, so to speak. Okay. Also on that document on the very last page, I have a few links to some certain things that we, you can do and visit in Leon when you are here and some links to that. And you can, you know, to, to find out what we can be doing. As you know, we, myself and um, my group of students here in Leon, we're working on preparing a very fun week for you all. All right. There's going to be academic stuff. There's going to be uh, work, lots of time to work on your projects and to finalize and present your projects. But there's also going to be time to visiting. We're organizing cultural events and we're organizing kind of fun um, group events in the evenings for you as well. OK, so to try and make it a, a full week and make it worth your while. All right. And Sina, we wanted to tell them, give everybody a heads up as well about the actual project, because some yeah. people were worried about the project. Yeah. Exactly. Do you want to say anything so about that? Yeah, just saying that we will tell you more about that next week, <laughs> but we're yeah. on it and uh, we didn't want to overwhelm you with um, information. We know that you have a lot to plan for this um, class, so um, don't be worried. Uh, you will get the information soon enough. We know exactly what you have to do for the last task. Um, mm. Don't worry about that. And of course, you can start thinking about um, what you want to do in your project, but don't be stressed, okay? I could see in the reports that some of um, some of the groups were already talking about this. Some of them were saying, we cannot really talk about it because we don't know what we have to do. Um, mm. But you will be able to do that and start just start reflecting on whether this is something you find interesting um, to work on or not, okay? And um, how you can actually use um, the information that our um, guest speaker share with us, um, um, how you can use Use that for your own project right exactly um, yeah. but don't be worried about that yeah yeah um, the idea is that the, you will get inspiration from the guest speakers that you are hearing every week about you know to come up with interesting an interesting teaching project for for your students okay so you know the ideas you've heard from from kelly from shannon and from the next two colleagues that are coming as well well, you know, that should, you know, be a basis for, for your projects. Okay. So you're not wasting your time by, you know, listening to these. They're all very closely connected to the actual project at the end. Okay. And we are okay. also very aware of the fact that you only have like three weeks basically to prepare your project. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Next week, the th they are in guest speakers from Germany, right? Exactly. It will be Jonna, another actually a PhD student. Um, so she isn't a doctor yet, uh, but still she knows a, a lot about um, gamification and um, escape games in foreign language teaching. So um, this is what she will talk to you about next week. Before that, as I um, said in the beginning, you will meet your working group this Friday um, to discuss Kelly's talk. Um, and right, I, I will stay here with the German students, the ones who are here. And yeah, thanks again, Kelly. Thanks a Thank lot for being here. Thank you very much, here. Kelly. Thanks a uh, lot. Thanks a lot. Great presentation. Okay. I think we learned a lot. Um, okay. Okay. See you all again next week, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>
Ibrahim, can you maybe just let us know who you are? 